Okay, with that, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get into some of the key considerations for Tracker when it comes to scaling. This is gonna cover a number of the topics that we've raised over the course of the Academy so far, um, but maybe uh, give you some, uh, some mitigation strategies or techniques that you would use to try to make uh, your, your chances of scaling successfully uh, more likely. Um, the key consideration here, the most important thing is to realize that you're going to, with a large scale tracker implementation, dramatically increase the number of users, the devices, the technical and organizational support that are required. So we want to go through what that should mean in terms of your planning and in, in terms of the, the kind of support that you need to be able to provide, the resources that would be necessary to achieve this. When we talk about scale, we, we talked about this a little bit in the beginning of the academy. Scale often is something that people don't think of across various dimensions. They think solely in terms of the number of users, which I think is the most obvious scale to think of. But there are other ways to think of scale also. So just like we were talking before about uh, you could be having multiple tracker programs that cover various different health areas, that's another way that you could think of scale. So that perhaps you scaled one national system that's around, uh, you know, adverse events following immunization. But that actually has a very small number of users potentially and a small amount of data that you would collect because there are not very many adverse events following immunization. There's not that many users that are responsible for conducting an investigation or reporting on adverse events. But if you start to add in additional services like malaria services, this is, has a much broader user base. There are many, many different care providers that have responsibility around malaria testing or malaria diagnosis um, of prescribing anti-malarials. And so you can see that even though you have two national implementations, they're dramatically different in the terms of the number of users, the amount of data, um, and the considerations around the hardware that would be associated with those users, et cetera. So that's the, the next piece is hardware and infrastructure. Again, you, you would find that in the malaria program, perhaps you have you know, 15,000 users compared to the adverse events program where you have 1,000 users. So this should really factor into your planning for budgeting purposes when it comes to the hardware that they would be using. This should factor into your decisions to use something like an MDM solution for Android like Jaime was discussing yesterday and can also factor into some of what Marcus will be discussing around the kind of infrastructure around hosting that you would need and whether or not you can continue to use the same infrastructure that you had for your aggregate system or for your smaller scale tracker system. Data, of course, is a, a, another change as you scale in the amount of data that you collect. This can have an impact on performance. It can have an impact uh, based on the storage space that you have available. It can also have an impact on how serious your data breaches might be or on how, uh, how big of an impact it would have if your data were to be corrupted or lost. So these are also key things to be thinking about when it comes to scale. And then finally, of course, geography. Um, geography has a very tangible impact on things like training, on providing user support, on replacing hardware, et cetera. So again, you may have had a system that uh, was considered national scale, but it was at a district level and the districts all had a good road network to travel there and to provide training. But when you scale down to something like the community health worker level or to the, the main primary health facility level, there, it may be, take much longer time to, to reach sites or to set up a location for users to receive training. So all of this is to say that your previous training, IT support, budgets, hosting approaches will all likely need to be modified as you scale up Tracker across any of these dimensions. So this is important in your project planning, uh, the template that we've provided for you and thinking through what your timeline should be, what your cost should be, and uh, what to expect uh, when trying to achieve you know, this, the scale that you're hoping for. So we'll, we'll talk about these in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, the users for Tracker, uh, more so than aggregate, for example, they're often at the lowest levels of the health system. 
Tracker is targeting specifically individual level data, which means that you're getting uh, close to the point where the data are generated. Either the data are being collected by the person that's actually providing the services, or maybe they're one or two steps away at a data clerk who is receiving those individual records. Uh, they're more difficult to reach to provide the kinds of IT support uh, that you would want to provide for any information system. So you may have many more people that are having troubles with their network or logging in, or they've deleted the application from their Android device and you need to have a way to stay in contact with them and to reach them. Many of these users are newer to the technology. Um, very often we're seeing that even in, in the more periphery areas, the people do have devices. They often are used to texting. They're used perhaps to kind of basic smartphones, but that doesn't mean they're used to using those in their work environment. That doesn't mean that they're uh, ready and prepared to use them while they're seeing a patient or for entering data. Um, and it's difficult to provide retrain. So you may go through a massive effort to train this high number of users uh, that takes an entire year to get around the country. And by the next year, you have 20% of those that are new and they weren't part of the training the year before. And so you have to think about what, what are your strategies for keeping people trained and up to date on the system. So some recommended approaches um, in the trainings themselves, uh, focus on the hardware and the, the devices that they will be using, getting them familiar. If you're providing Android devices, this means not just teaching them the app itself, but also the basics of how to make sure that the phone remains charged and talk to them about whether or not the phones are waterproof and make sure that they know what to do if they are logged out or if they need to re-download the application. So there are many kind of basics of the, the hardware that you might want to be giving them some more familiarity with. This of course adds time to the training where you may spend the first day um, on topics related to maintaining and storing and keeping charge these devices. Um, so planning for that appropriately. Having a frontline IT support strategy. So again, this may mean devolving some of the IT support down to other areas of your health system. And often this means you don't have the funding to actually hire a new IT support staff for every district. But perhaps what you can do is train your district uh, supervisors for a given health program to field the most basic IT support questions about what to do if their hardware has been broken or lost, about what to do if somebody has trouble logging in, how do you get them a new password? So some of these basic things that if the entire country were reaching out to your central team, they would be quickly overwhelmed with those kinds of questions. So trying to devolve some of those tasks down to the lower level so that the system can uh, remain functioning. Uh, it's also a good idea to provide some of those basic guidance and support in the form of hard materials that they can have at the clinic um, or, or for the community health worker. Give them a poster, give them a handout, give them uh, some kind of very graphic or easy to read uh, kind of instructions on how to handle the most basic uh, support problems that they, they might have. Um, Again, as we said from yesterday, strongly consider using mobile device management, being able to redeploy an updated app, um, being able to determine the location of your Android devices, being able to see uh, the, the amount of users using the system. These are all things that will help you to better manage your implementation. Um, the, the, the next point about location specific synchronization plan. What, what this is referring to is that many of the locations is they're on Android, they, they may not have good connectivity. And you will want to know from the district level or even from the local users, how will they be synchronizing their devices? Is there a location that they know of where they can go to and synchronize their device? Do you need to establish a plan where on a weekly basis, they are expected to travel to that location? Maybe that's at their district. Maybe they already have a regular meeting with their supervisor or with the other facilities in the area. But if so, that should be a part of their training, rather than hoping that they will figure out themselves how often to synchronize or where to go to do that. 
uh, it would be nice to give them that uh, as a plan that you've developed with the, the local knowledgeable people about how and where they can synchronize their device. And when it comes to kind of retraining, thinking through who at the district can continue to provide those kinds of training and refresher courses. Uh, when someone is hired or it's a new person at the location, what are the kinds of materials that you have available for them to, to learn the system themselves with support from their fellow colleagues or with support from a district supervisor? When it comes to health program coverage, again, these tracker programs can be kind of stacked and used in combination across health services. Uh, the data entered in the tracker often represent a wide number of paper-based report and work processes for the user. These health programs are resistant to some of these changing processes. They're used to doing things a certain way, and they're not always happy to have yet another new system being, being sent their way. And the health programs themselves often have different indicators and ways of representing data, but they come from a single source of data. So the user is used to entering one piece of information, whereas the health programs, perhaps TB wants to see some representation of the HIV data, but they want to see it in a different way that the, than the HIV program does. And so you wanna be careful about the design of your forms and how the, the data are being analyzed. So a, a way to kind of think through some of these combinations of health programs and the way things are being reported is to have a steering committee at the national level that combines the different health programs that are going to be affected by these changes. Um, and that usually means getting a, an appointed representative from the health programs. So if you're trying to have a, a coverage of health programs for HIV, for TB and malaria, there should probably be a representative from the national programs for TB, HIV and malaria that not are only there at the very beginning, but that they take some ownership of these systems. They know how the system works. They agree to the way that they are designed. They understand the, the training program and the IT support structure, and they can be a focal person as the system matures and as changes are made, they contain kind of the history of the, the program. They also are involved in any of the decisions about whether you're going to be changing processes or not, or if you're going to be replacing paper. Um, with this group, you would want to review all the guidelines and processes that could be affected and perhaps take the chance to streamline your processes. So again, if there are uh, at this point two or three different paper reports for different programs, but they actually are representations of some of the same data, you may want to be able to combine that into uh, one program or into one way of reporting the data. Try to make things as easy as possible for the user. One of the key benefits of digitizing is that they don't need to repeatedly enter the same information on various different forms. And so you wanna give them that benefit. Uh, to try to make reporting easier for them and their, their responsibilities uh, streamlined. Um, developing a strategy from the beginning to remove redundant processes. So what we've seen when it comes to actually replacing paper, for example, uh, the, the way to make that happen is to agree at the outset of the program, what is the strategy for deciding when to remove paper? Um, are you going to do an evaluation after three months or after six months? What would need to be the uh, what would need to be the outcome of that evaluation in order to agree to remove paper? If you don't have these conversations at the beginning of your implementation, it, it dramatically lengthens the time that it takes to make those decisions uh, because nobody is looking at it, uh, nobody's sure what the goal is and whether they should be trying to change processes. And so it can take much longer to come to these kinds of agreements. And the design of your program, we've talked a little bit about this before, should really take into careful account what all of your analytic needs are. You want to see from that steering committee that all of the different health programs have approved, what data are being collected, what analytics will be put out. You don't want to find out two months into your implementation that you're missing some key data elements and that you're going to now need to update all of your programs. Uh, you're going to need to provide communication to your users and perhaps some level of retraining. So you really want to know ahead of the implementation that you've covered all of your data needs. 
hardware, the infrastructure data. Again, we've talked about a lot of these challenges at the beginning. I won't go through all of those, uh, trying to stay on time here. But uh, some of the recommended approaches here would be that you establish at the beginning the processes you would need to maintain and replace hardware over time. Um, so it's great you, you have you know, 5,000 Android devices that have come through a certain project or that have been budgeted. What is the plan for to replacing those devices? How long do you expect those devices to stay in the field? Will they last one year? Will they last two years? What percentage of those devices do you expect to break or be lost? What's the process for someone to order or receive a new device? All of these should be kind of a part of your implementation plan so that you are ensuring continuity of the system. It's a, it's a very challenging thing to spend all of the time and effort on building a program, training people on it, rolling it out, only to have them lose an Android device six months into the system and get no replacement. Uh, that ends up being then a lot of wasted resources on a system that they can no longer use. Um, conduct a landscape review of the other digital health interventions and consider the co combinations. So what already is out there? How many different programs are, are the users that you are targeting supposed to be using already? Is there a way to combine data collection in those systems? Do you need to make those systems interoperable? Um, is there some way to maybe replace one of those systems so that you can not have redundant systems? Um, review the hosting guidelines, plan for increased requirements. So if what you've put together is the bare minimum for hosting as you roll out one tracker program, then you already know you'll have a problem for any health program that tries to add, which is the most common thing that we see. As soon as you know, TB gets a digitized program at the provider level, HIV is going to want the same thing. And so you want to make sure that you've thought through how would you increase your hosting capacities when you bring in other programs. Um, again, we'll have a specific session about security and privacy kind of guidelines and what the policy approaches are, but this is something that you'll want to do at the outset. Try to have an approved policy in place, something that the different health programs have all agreed to, that the Ministry of Health has signed off on, perhaps that is uh, even approved or in line with the legislation in the country, so that there are no questions six months into the system about whether it's adhering to expected requirements. And then on the hosting topic, again, which we'll dive into a little bit more, we know there is often a kind of default expectation to host at the ministry or at a local hardware server um, approach. And this is something that requires a lot of additional expertise and uh, can be something that over time costs more as you try to replace uh, hardware and think through your requirements. It's, it's much better in many cases to outsource that challenge. Uh, the kind of expertise that it takes to run a large scale nationally uh, uh, scaled tracker implementation for hardware is something you might not have the expertise in the ministry. And it's often difficult to keep those people employed because of course in the private sector, somebody that is very skilled at database administration, at managing you know, thousands of users, at, at dealing with any hardware challenges that come up, they can receive better salaries outside of the national public health system. And so it can be very difficult to, to try to fund those people internally to manage a, a locally based installation. So it's, it's worth having the conversation, even if you have heard before and you know that they want to host locally, it's worth approaching the conversation again in the context of these nationally scaled tracker considerations. For the geography, uh, we've already talked about some of this, increase your dedicated IT staff at the national level as well. Uh, make sure that they are well staffed to be able to provide the kind of support even to your secondary level. So if what you've done is established a district level frontline support, those people still need to have somebody at the national level that they can refer problems to or they can ask questions to. You want to make sure that you're not overwhelming your national IT staff because there's been no increase in staffing despite a dramatic in increase in needs. Trainings, um, again, cascade kinds of trainings perhaps is the way to go. Um, it depends on what your resources are and your timelines, but you may want to think that you actually are going to do a slower rollout than you would do for other kinds of systems because you only have five training teams, but you need to cover, you know, 55 districts. 
um, it can take a lot longer than you would have expected from other types of IT systems that are rolled out. Consider establishing a hotline for reporting system problems. This can be through uh, a phone and uh, phone number that people can reach out to for immediate support. This can be through uh, an SMS message that they send. This can be an online support system. It actually probably could be all three of those. But then of course you need to staff that hotline as well. You need to have somebody that knows the system that can respond and that can escalate real problems to make sure that there, there are no uh, system gaps or, or downtime that don't need to be there. And routinely conduct uh, reviews of the system with the IT support team and adjust the, the support accordingly so that you're learning over time as well. No uh, implementation plan is going to be perfect from day one, but you want to have a process for thinking through what improvements can be made over time. So I'll, I'll end here, I think on the general recommendations, uh, put significant effort into managing expectations from the outset. Uh, this, this kind of a list of the challenges is something you can share with the national programs, with the, the ministry people that are responsible for making decisions so that they understand what they're getting themselves into. This helps, you know, three months from now when there's, uh, when you haven't met timelines or if there's some unexpected uh, need for more resources, that it's not as surprising, um, that you haven't overpromised. Um, again, communicating that these implementations are difficult. Uh, they may be kind of the largest implementation that your country has undertaken. And so making sure that people are aware that that comes with challenges. Um, initiate some long-term budget discussions around all of these different pieces. So again, having a plan for this year on how things are going to be budgeted is great. What are you going to do two, three, four years from now? If the expectation is that you're building a national system that has become a part of your public health uh, resources and needs, how are you going to fund that indefinitely past the life of the current donor cycle or the current project that is funding it? So getting some agreements at the highest levels that perhaps after two years or after three years of funding that the government will have you know, increased resources to give to IT support or that there would be a review process every two years around hardware needs and where the budgeting can be found for that, for example. Go slowly is a, is a standard recommendation. Um, try, try things out, see how the training are working, adjust as needed, see how many IT support requests are coming through and if you need more resources before you add more users. Um, and use a phased rollout approach so that you're, you're rolling out not based on some deadline that we want this all done by August, but rather you are expecting to grow a mature system and you want to evaluate it over time as you roll it out to make sure that you're meeting your objectives uh, so that you know the system is working in one location before you're moving it to the second location or the third. And again, getting the most out of these individual level system does mean replacing processes. You don't want to duplicate reporting all the time. You don't want the users to be coming in on their, their days off to try to catch up with uh, all of the extra work required in a digital system. So try to establish these expectations from the outset that uh, you're hoping to replace processes and make uh, life easier for the users. And so how will you go about doing that? So. I know this was, this was a lot of information all at once. Um, usually this session would be one where we have a lot of interaction back and forth with you to learn more about your country and what you think the, some of the challenges are. So I'd, I'd really appreciate it if in the questions you can pose uh, you know, your own consider, considerations or concerns. Of course, these slides will be available to you. So they are hopefully slides that you can use when talking to partners in the country and when trying to explain some of these difficulties. Um, so hopefully these will be a useful resource and hopefully they will also feed into the sessions that you have around the long term planning and the, the planning uh, documentation that you're doing so that you think through what the budgeting implications might be or what the training implications might be. So again, we'll, we'll make these available to you. You can hopefully follow up on uh, on any of them that you want to have additional information on in the Slack channels. And I think with that, I'd better stop talking so we have time to, to move on to the next part of the session. So Marcus, I will turn it over to you to take us into some more of the hosting considerations. Thanks a lot, 
Mike. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, there. All right. Uh, I trust you can see my screen. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcus. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pull us through this uh, next uh, part, which is about hosting um, of um, tracker systems. Um, we are gonna talk about some of the decisions that you will be faced with um, as uh, managers when you are gonna host a tracker and. Um, um, we are going to lead into some of the discussions uh, and um, and also try to help you answer some of your questions on what decisions uh, you have to make. Um, with me today uh, is also Bob. He's um, uh, one of the people who knows um, this uh, topic best and will um, hopefully be able to help me answer some questions and also chime in with his um, points of view um, as we go here. Um, and with that, let's uh, look at this old friend, the house. Um, when we talk about house hosting, um, it's natural to think about the very top layer of the foundation there called infrastructure. Um, and uh, hosting is about uh, setting up and, and uh, managing this infrastructure. Um, but um, I would argue that there is also other rooms that is involved in the tracker house when you're setting up your hosting. Um, today, we're going to spend uh, some time on five decision points. And um, the first one is um, is whether or not to set up a new or instance or uh, or use an existing instance if you already have DHS in some form or fashion. Do you want a new one or do you want to set up uh, the tracker on an existing instance? Um, there is many things that comes into this discussion, uh, and we will um, look at that question a little bit more closely later. Uh, the next uh, part is um, is the architecture of your uh, solution. What is the, um, the setup you, you need in terms of servers, in terms of other interacting services? Um, and what is the environment you're setting up your tracker in? Um, the third decision point we will discuss is uh, whether or not you want to, uh, and Mike touched on this briefly, whether or not you want uh, soft, uh, to buy the DHS software as a service, whether you are buying infrastructure as a service and setting up um, DHS yourself, or whether you use some form of local hosting um, in your data center, for example, in the government data center or, or in your basement. <clears throat> Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, things that goes into this discussion, this decision. Um, then on the backup restore routines, uh, the, we um, you will have to make some decisions on on um, what is the acceptable level of risk and what is the acceptable level of loss in case of a of a disaster, um, and also. Um, what is the requirements for your restore in case there is a disaster? And lastly, monitoring. What type of monitoring are you going to set up and how are you going to use it? Um, so the way this is going to work is that we will uh, spend some time on each of these topics and we will answer in essence uh, a few uh, yes or no, or uh, a few questions so that has three or two or three uh, possible answers. Um, 
And while we are doing these slides and looking at the questions, there is a Mentimeter going and that uh, you can um, answer the questions uh, together with uh, everyone else. And uh, the Mentimeter code is here and, and it's going to be shared on the, on the chat. Um, so please go ahead and, and log in, but wait, do not answer the first question. Is that clear? You can open the Mentimeter, but do not answer the first question. We're going to do that together when we look at the slides. Um, I will let you know when we're going to answer the first question uh, and uh, the second and so forth. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, when it comes to, before we start diving into the questions, we can talk about some general ideas that goes into the, uh, the, um, the requirements for your hosting. Uh, your pro project will have some requirements <clears throat> and you have to review the scope of the project. There's a very big difference between a small scale uh, silo project, for example, a malaria vector control um, or a national HIV tracker. Uh, and uh, this, the scope will inform many of the questions we are going to look at together. Um, another thing that um, informs the, the decisions are <clears throat> how your programs fit together. If, um, if you need interaction between the different programs that you're setting up, um, and uh, if you need your data to travel between um, the different um, sort of instances or concerns. Um, whether you have aggregate or not is uh, going to affect the, the rest of the questions we're going to ask here. So for uptime, this is another um, an another big driver for some requirements. Um, your users might need um, more uptime if they are actually um, entering data uh, live um, instead of back entry. The users might might also um, uh, either work during the day or they might uh, work during the um, of other hours. We have seen that in COVID surveillance, the COVID teams uh, and in stressed situations are working from very early morning and very late in the evening. So um, other things like an HIV tracker might have a more um, uh, working hour related um, uptime requirement. If it's down in the evening for a while, it's not a problem. Um, and mostly um, during work hours. Uh, oops. So um, the IT support unit is also part of this. Uh, are you prepared to have uh, support for your users? Um, if you now have thousands of users, it's going to be a, a big need for support. And uh, if they're working outside working hours, what's the plan for supporting them? Um, and um, when are your users going to connect? How is the, uh, their um, access to the internet, for example? Um, do they probably have to work in the night because the um, in internet falls down during the day? This might be a consideration to take in. Um, the last thing um, on this slide is the consequences for unplanned downtime. If, um, if you get a downtime that wasn't planned, what will actually happen? Uh, if if the, um, the system is being used replacing paper, this might be a huge problem, a practical problem. Um, if your uh, system is, uh, is the clinic system that is actually needed to see patients, um, unplanned downtime might be a disaster. Whereas if you do back entry, um, it might not be a, a huge problem if um, if the back entry gets delayed um, a bit. Um, also, in an Android setting, you are more resilient to unplanned planned downtime than you would be if um, if you're using only the web. Um, when it comes to tracker versus aggregate. Um, there's some considerations that uh, we will get into, uh, so I won't spend too much time on them now. Tracker might require a newer version of DHS2 because of functionality, 
Um, and lately, stability and performance, the later versions of DHS and later point versions is much, much faster than the older ones. Uh, the other <clears throat> potential um, thing to think about is security fixes. You want to stay on a new tracker version because <clears throat> because we put security fixes into the, uh, the code. And, uh, <clears throat> and if you're on a very old code base, there might be that is not supported anymore, for example, these security fixes might not come so easily to you. This uh, is, of course, a problem also in the tracker, uh, in the aggregate world. But in the tracker world, it's usually a bigger problem if your um, data is not as secure as it could be. Um, the requirements for access control might be higher in tracker than in in um, uh, in aggregate. Uh, the granularity of each user's access um, might be different in uh, in tracker and aggregate. Marcus, can I chime in with a quick comment? Yeah, please, Bob. Um, it's picking up on your point that tracker requires a newer version of DHS to. It's also important to bear in mind, I guess, that you need to not just implement a new version, but you need to keep it up to date. And so part of the planning process should include doing regular patch, patching of your DHS to, sometimes it's something that people don't take into account. They don't take the budgeting for it or the time out for it. Um, so yeah, it's important to realize it's not something that you just install and then you're gonna run for the next five years. You're gonna to have to upgrade it typically at least once a year. You're gonna to have to do patch upgrades perhaps every couple of months. That's a great point. Um, and, uh, we, we also brought it up in the long-term tracker maintenance uh, session earlier for those who attended there. Um, the point releases are um, generally released on a six week cycle. So even if you're on the very latest version today, uh, in six weeks, there will be a newer version. Um, and uh, this newer version will contain fixes and it will, might contain security fixes. So um, as Bob points out, uh, this is an ongoing effort to stay on the latest code. Um, that is uh, under much more pressure on the tracker instance than it might be on your um, aggregate one. Thanks, um, thanks, Bob. Um, the last the point I had here was on the um, disaster require recovery. The requirements in tracker might be very different than aggregate, um, both in times so of how. Um, long the timeline will be for restoring the data um, and also in terms of data loss if you have an, a, a tracker instance then there will be data coming into that instance uh, much more frequently than on an aggregate instance and if, if you um, have a disaster uh, then more data will usually be lost uh, and it might be harder to find this data again um, if, uh, if a lot of different users, if uh, a thousand users enters a little bit of data, it might be much harder to get back the data loss. Um, okay, so um, to jump into the first um, the first decision point or first question, um, we are going to talk a bit about uh, whether or not to set up a new instance or use an existing instance. Um, what we mean here is um, if you have an existing HMIS like this and, and you're going to implement a tracker pro, uh, project, you might simply put the new programs for this new tracker program project inside the existing HMIS instance. That is one option. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, about the pros and cons of each option um, on the next slide, but just introducing uh, what I mean. Um, the other option is um, if you have an existing tracker uh, instance like this, you will have existing programs and metadata, and you might put your new program on the same instance uh, as your existing tracker. Um, the third option is um, to set up the new tracker on a separate instance um, and make the new programs on this separate new instance. 
So these are the three options that um, we should consider together. And, and um, you can see the monthly code uh, repeated at the bottom of the screen there. We're going to go through some uh, pros, pros and cons. Um, and, um, and then you can re reply to Menti1. Um, and, uh, and please, uh, when you reply to these questions, um, please either um, think of the tracker project that you're about to plan or um, about a tracker project that you have done. Or if not, then you can make your hypothetical uh, tracker project um, an answer uh, from from the point of view of this hypothetical tracker project that um, that you, you make it. So the first question: new instance or existing? First option: Do I add the tracker to an existing HMIS aggregate instance? Um, and the pros is that the, the the pros I could think of is that the, there will be less complexity in the architecture if you do that. If you already have a server and a database, then setting up a new instance um, or adding to this existing instance might be uh, the simplest option uh, that produces the less, less complexity in the architecture. Um, it might also be slightly easier to connect tracker and aggregate data and visualize it together in dashboards. This one got a little bit of a smaller font because uh, it's not super hard to move this data between the instances either. Uh, so, um, and this is the topic of the next session with Ola. Uh, and you should, um, but, but it is uh, a pro, I would say. Um, so for the cons here, uh, we, we sometimes see conflicting requirements for uptime and security in the tracker um, versus an aggregate instance. And there might be uh, routines and, and, um, and um, there might be practices on your uh, aggregate instance that is not good enough for your tracker projects. Um, there might also be other users of your HMIS, so there is no not only do you get no help from the existing users and, and setup um, on your HMIS, um, you might act actively have a problem in that in the HMIS instance, you have uh, some users that are super users that should not be able to see or track your data. Uh, super users is a super bad idea. In any case, you should have as few as you can. But in the HMS, there might be a different super user than the one you want to be super user for your tracker setup. Um, also, there will be probably be very little metadata um, overlap. The org units might um, be one of the uh, areas where um, yeah, you have an overlap between the tracker and the aggregate, but there it might also not be. It might be that the org units is not matching. Um, do you want to add something here to this one, Bob? Or? I'll let you chime in. Um, the, the next Sorry, question. Yeah. You, you did. <laughs> um, do you want me to answer? What? I just wondered, wondered if you had any other thoughts on the first point, uh, or the other pros and cons, or thoughts about uh, what is here. Yeah, I think we covered most of. I suppose also stability you haven't talked about. I mean, often the HMIS system is something that may have been there for for. A number of years it may be quite stable and it does what it does and introducing a tracker program to it very often particularly in the early stages of, of implementation may introduce instability to your hmis which is generally something that people want to avoid because it's a... that is uh, that is true 
Uh, it's also a point that uh, is uh, brought up on the next uh, question. Do I add a new tracker to an existing tracker instance? If you have an existing tracker, um, then you might get the pro of a longitudinal record that goes across different services. If you already have a HIV tracker uh, and, and you're introducing your COVID tracker, um, then uh, you might say that it, it's tempting to add the, uh, the COVID tracker to the H existing HIV tracker. Uh, because um, the record will then, uh, any person can pr probably be enrolled um, either in the HIV program or the COVID program or in, in both. And if they're enrolled in both, then you have um, a very nice longitudinal record for that person. Um, so, th so this might be one reason to combine the trackers, especially if you have functional needs that goes across the different services and um, you want your family practice uh, tracker to involve uh, mother and child health or ANC, um, then uh, combining the trackers in one instance might be what you need. Uh, and another pro uh, combining trackers is uh, that um, the overlap between metadata might be much bigger and you might have data elements, track entry attributes. Um, you might have defined um, a lot of uh, reusable metadata uh, for, uh, for your new instance if you already have an existing instance. And you can harmonize the data elements and, and uh, maintenance across the two instances. Um, so some of the cons, um, the first one, are you actually going to use longitudinal record across services? That's like a counter asking the question. If you have an HIV tracker and a COVID surveillance tracker, will you actually end up having any practical use for, the, for combining these two things? Um, Will, uh, will the HIV personnel have access to the COVID data or, and vice versa, or will you actually not open up this uh, and, and use this for anything? And another con is um, the same as the pro, already existing metadata might also be a problem. Um, already existing metadata might be a source of a conflict and, and if you plan to integrate your tracker instances, then you should plan for um, quite a lot of work um, to uh, align the metadata between the instances. It's not might not be easy, and it might ne uh, need uh, functional discussions. It might need um, a process to align the metadata between the instances. Um, and another con uh, is the server resources um, being shared. If you set up two trackers on the same instance, it's much harder to scale because they will um, they will consume the same server resources. So many of the COVID surveillance and vaccine um, uh, setups lately uh, were set up on a new server for this reason alone. Uh, they were expecting to push the limits of, um, of what the tracker can uh, do. And if you're expecting to push the limits, then you should not set up two trackers on the same, uh, on the same um, server. So um, for COVID, many ended up with uh, the third option that uh, you will see in your Mente. That, will, uh, that was not really listed as an option explicitly, but that's setting up this as a new uh, instance. Um, please uh, click the answer in your menti uh, and, and select one of the options, and then we will go on to the next slide. Um, on the architecture side, uh, one of the questions that you should uh, answer is whether you, you run the database and the application together on the same server. And some pros is, of course, less complexity in the architecture. Um, if you have several uh, several servers running different um, parts of the archi uh, architecture, that's more complexity for you. 
uh, and it might be cheaper to have just one ser server if that's an option. Uh, the con is just simply that uh, it's harder to scale the server resources are shared between the application and the database. Um, it might also be slightly harder to monitor. Oh, this, this, Sorry, go ahead. There's a nuance to that. Um, there is a slight nuance to that because one thing that's quite common to do is you might have the same actual server, the same virtual machine, but you might run your database and your and your DHS two application as separate containers with it. And that's very, very commonly done. And that has some of the advantages of both really. I mean, you've got less complexity in the sense that you're just managing one virtual machine, but you also have the advantage that you can um, quite precisely control the amount of server resources that are allocated to the database and to the, to the Tomcat. So it's, a, I guess, a hybrid of the two approaches. In fact, it's probably the most common. So they're running on the same machine, but they're running in separate containers on that machine. There's like virtualization within virtualization. I see that uh, Abdul is also asking a question about this. Um, so, um... If, if you're setting up uh, two different containers um, and running it on, on one server, um, they will be um, the, the two instances are not are, are competing for the same server resources. Uh, but um, it might be easier to scale if you do need to move the database to a different server later. Um, and it might also be easier to monitor the two. Um, containers um, uh, different um, uh, separately. Uh, I see that Abdul is um, using a software as a service provider. And uh, this question was not posed to him whether to run the, this on, on uh, a different servers or, or together. Uh, do you know anything about this club? Um, if you're uh, if you're ordering software as a service, you might get less uh, insight into how the underlying setup is actually working. Yeah, I mean, I don't know too many software as a service providers. I mean, EAO system is probably the, the most well known one, um, and I think in their case, it's a, it's a it's a specific offering. You, you decide whether you want to run it. I think they have different sized instances. And the smaller ones will run together and the larger ones get separated. There is something to bear in mind if you're running in the cloud in particular and you're running your database separate to your, to your application. It does mean that by default, all of the traffic between your DHS2 and your database is potentially running in plain text uh, through your cloud provider's network. And so often you would need to, what you should really do is on your, when you're setting up your JDBC connection, you want to use SSL on that connection so that the traffic between the database and the, and the DHS2 instance is all encrypted. And that's the other advantage of actually containerizing them, because if you run it on the same actual single machine, but you run them in separate containers, then the traffic is never is never traversing through the cloud provider's network. Yeah, I think with the with the with the, the SaaS offerings, typically it's a it's it's a, it's a choice with a price point, right? You can right. pay to have it all, you know. It's what I call the boom box, right? You can have a boom box, which you know everything is all in one, or you can have a component high file system where everything is stacked, and one costs more than the other. Yeah. And there are security considerations to bear in mind if you think about your traffic going through the cloud provider's network. We we will also get a little bit into the different options. Uh... Uh, of SAS or um, 
yeah, and the other options uh, later here. And, um, and Bob uh, will also be able to answer and give some detail on the um, uh, on this on the on the questions channel. If um, um, if there's any anyone that needs that wants to follow up on this uh, um, on this securities uh, consideration for running a SAS. Um, uh, an another thing to consider um, is semantic question to be, and that's other applications in your ecosystem. You, you can just go ahead and answer QA if uh, if you have an answer, um, uh, and then uh, on, on answer to be, um, you might be in an environment where you need to connect to other um, other types of systems or other services. If you have a SMS service, you might need the Rapid Pro. Uh, integration. Um, if you're working close with the hospital, you might, um, or someone using OpenMRS, you might, uh, you might uh, need to connect with uh, with them and transfer data. Integrate. Um, there might be a civil registry that you need the data from, uh, or potentially send data to. Um, and there is no general answer or general general um, um, reveal questions that can be, can be answered generically here. Um, we invite you in Menti2B to put in uh, into the word cloud what your, your environment looks like. So um, please go ahead and enter into Menti2B if, if you have any considerations in the landscape in your ecosystem that uh, is relevant to you. Uh, next, uh, next topic is software as a service uh, infrastructure as a service or local hosting. Software as a service um, means that you would uh, pay someone to run your DHS instance for you, and you would have less insight into the underlying um, system. You would not probably not have access to the server either. Infrastructure as a service means that you would rent uh, containers, you would rent servers. Um, that you can access um, through a command line or to log on to, but uh, the hardware is actually hosted somewhere else, and and the hardware is is um, um, is, uh, is is run by someone else. Um, this this might be a, a variant of this might be a local uh, software, a, a local infrastructure uh, provider that uh, that. Um, might be running a, a local data center for you, and you would rent access to their service. Um, the last one is uh, local hosting, and this is what I put in this bucket is everything that essentially means you have to make sure that the server hardware is running as well. Uh, and uh, everything from the hardware and up is your responsibility. Um, so some pros for software as a service, um, it's super easy to get started. It's by far the easiest one. Um, usually you can just contact one of these uh, providers and, and um, you, you get a login to the DHS instance and you can start working. Um, and the uptime for the, both the hardware and the service uh, is, is included. You, you wouldn't be responsible for keeping the service up. Um, also, monitoring and often upgrades might be included in this uh, package. Uh, you might um, get alerts um, and they might monitor your server resource consumption um, and uh, potentially also have an upgrade plan. Um, at the very least, if there is an important um, security update, they might um, they might intervene and, uh, and let you know that the server has to be upgraded. So some cons is that um, you probably would not have access to the database or the server because this is their responsibility and therefore they don't want you to mess around there in, in their server. Um, if, uh, if you need to log on and run uh, SQL and so forth, uh, this is probably not going to be an option for software as a service. 
Um, you also get a little bit of a higher dependency on external parties. I mentioned help desk here. I've seen that many times that like um, we are trying to help someone on the software as a service plan and they need a custom word file or urgent update SQL script, something like that. And, and um, to actually get this run, they would have to go through a third party and, and, um, and this might be a problem in some uh, press situations. It might mean that um, uh, some things takes more time. Uh, for infrastructure as a service, just a reminder, this is renting a, ser uh, a server, more or less, and then you have to put on the software yourself. You have to install DHS and database and do everything that, like that yourself. Um, the pro of this is that the infrastructure of time is guaranteed through what you're renting. You, you'll, if, uh, you, you will not be the one that uh, handles hard disk crashes and, um, and the hardware. Um, it uh, is often easy, easy to scale and upgrade uh, if you're uh, if you're running your um, uh, your service in a smart way. It uh, might be easy to migrate to a bigger server if you need that. Uh, some cons is that this is recurring costs. Um, this is the same as of above, of course. If you're uh, renting something as a service, there is a re recurring cost every month. Um, but um, uh, and the other, not really a con, but something to think of is that if you're renting the infrastructure and you're setting it up yourself, uh, you will need local capacity. Someone in your team needs to know how to uh, set up and configure this, um, uh, this um, uh, server. Um, Mike, you had your hand up. Yes, sorry. This is just a, a time warning that we're, we're a bit over time. So just uh, pointing it out for you. I'll try to speed up a little bit and um, we might uh, use a little bit less time on the event day. We might go back to it in the break after Jerry. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, please answer Menti 3 uh, as we are on this slide. Uh, do I use local hosting? You can. Uh, this will give you full control over hardware and software. Uh, but I think maybe more, more of the main pros of this is that the main cost will be upfront. So uh, buying the server, buying infrastructure will be upfront. It might be easy to get uh, this, this budgeted into your your project uh, if there is a, um, when the project gets funded um, and harder to have a recurring cost. Cons is of course that you have to plan for both hardware and software failure, which means setting aside uh, funds to replace hardware if something breaks. You have to have the knowledge on how to replace it. Um, and um, all the infrastructure uptime is the team's responsibility. Um, you need um, you need to have the capacity for running uh, all the aspects of uh, um, the server. And for a large scale tracker implementation, this means that you need a really professional team, and you should have people in this team that has done this before um on other software or or on the on the hs ideally but on other software have run um, a large scale implementation and know how this is done um so meant before now uh on the backup restore routines uh frequency is the first question do you need a mirror site a continuous backup and a disaster recovery without data loss so this means that you, in essence, everything that got, gets saved in your database gets saved uh, twice. Um, this is what you do if you uh, cannot accept any data loss. Um, if it's not okay with the nightly backup, if something uh, goes wrong, then, uh, then uh, they, uh, one day of lost work is not acceptable. Then you need to have some sort of mirror site or continuous backup running. Um, this is possible to set up with a database failover. If, if uh, the database fails, you might automatically um, uh, fail over to the to the to, to the mirror site, and the users wouldn't uh, rec uh, wouldn't see any downtime if the database would fall uh, fall offline. This is of course very high maintenance that's to come, and very few people do it. Um, 
and um, it would have uh, more costs uh, from more hardware. Uh, so what many people choose is to live with a backup recovery plan that will potentially lose some hours of data, but not a lot of data. Uh, the, this might be manageable in many cases, that's why it's chosen. Uh, the cost and maintenance is easy. Uh, it's uh, more or less just setting up an interval and doing a backup and storing that backup. Um, the con, of course, is that some of the latest data would be lost if you have a disaster. Um, so uh, last option is data loss of so little consequence that you can live without a backup. Uh, the pro is uh, no cost. The con is uh, you should always, this was a trick question, you should always back up your system regularly. Um, yeah, and please, uh, that was cement before A, so please answer that <laughs> question in your uh, um, Menti. Um, the next one, uh, backup restart routines. Uh, do you need a, to keep a longer backlog of backups? And the pros of a longer backlog is that you can recover data over longer periods if, if someone deletes something by accident and notices it a week down the road. Um, you might recover it. Um, and also when investigating problems, uh, it might be nice to could go back a few, um, a few weeks or a few days at least um, and, and restore uh, an older backup. Uh, and the only con is that such backups takes more space. There's also the wrinkle of backups kind of, um, backups are very sensitive. And if they get um, spread around, then that's sensitive data that gets spread around. So keep how, how and where to keep your backups is a very important point. Uh, do you need an office? Office, there's also another. Yeah, sorry. There, there's a refinement over keeping longer backups because you, you can't keep a daily backup forever, right? Because the space requirement obviously becomes too much. But I mean, what we typically would do is you might decide keep the last seven days backup, right? On a rolling sliding window, but then also keep the weekly backup, maybe every Sunday's backup, and then you can keep that for six weeks. And then you may keep the backup once a month and keep that perhaps for the last 12 months. So um, you kind of lose granularity as you go further back in time, but you're still able to get a backup and restore them from this time last year. That's the way I do it. Anyway. That's a good point, uh, Bob. Thanks a lot. Um, the last uh, one is do we need an offsite backup? Um, um, Offsite means you store your backup somewhere else than uh, your um, your data is uh, your server is running, and this is resilient to real world disasters. If something strikes your data center um, or knocks out your uh, service provider, um, then you might actually not only lose your uh, day to day instance, you might lose all your data and all your backups if you don't keep it offsite. Um, the con is that it might be more expensive. Um, and uh, if, if you're transporting it over the internet, that must, might also be a hurdle. Uh, but it's something to think about. Uh, and if you don't have it, then um, it's nice to uh, make a note that uh, you don't have it. If, you're, if your uh, data is stored on the same um, on the same site, then there is a chance you might lose everything. And, and um, that chance might be very, very small. Uh, but it's there, and sometimes it's not acceptable. Um, the last monthly question is on monitoring. And um, uh, first question, do you set up an application to use database and uh, yes. do you set up application and database monitoring? Do you do it? Uh, yes, you should, because it makes it possible to see problems before they hit the users. And you can see the server uh, health deteriorating. Uh, also, it makes it possible to do retroactively inspect events that is reported. Um, the cons is not really there. I mean, you have to set it up, but there is no real other con setting up uh, monitoring. Uh, so we recommend that you do that uh, always. Uh, of course, uh, you need to have a routine for looking at it from time to time um, or using it uh, as well. 
but if you, even if you don't have a very good routine, it's important to have the monitoring there. It will help uh, in case something does arise. Um, it's nice that it's already been capturing data that you can go back and look at, for example. Um, do we set up automated alerts? Yeah, you can. It makes it possible to get automated messages if something happens. Um, irrespective if you have a poor routine for looking at uh, inspecting the server, or even if this is a good routine, then uh, something might happen late at night and uh, it's useful to get a message. Um, the cons, um, it may, must be so that these automated alerts are not a false security. The, you will only get an automated res, um, automated response on, on data that you already set up. Um, but um, this uh, and so, uh, this this might also be a reason for not checking the server health yourself, which uh, might be needed. Uh, and if you set it, if you don't, don't set up, up well, you will produce noise for yourself that you wouldn't pay attention to, um, or it would not report on something that is actually important. So setting up automated alerts might be nice, but it's also, um, it takes a bit of effort to be uh, good and useful. Okay, um, that was my last uh, slide and we are a bit over time. So I think I will give the word to uh, Jerry now. And then after Jerry and in the break, we will have a review of the questions. Um, I will go to Mente uh, and uh, those interested can have a look. I will also paste the results after these slides so that you can see them later. Um, but right now, uh, the word of the day is ain't no mountain high. Um, and uh, I will give the word to Jerry and his uh, West Central Africa. The word of the day is ain't no mountain high. I hope you all um, hear my voice. Yes, so, you. okay, great. So I'm going to talk about two approaches that we had for scaling and hosting. Um, so the, the difference was mainly on, on scaling, but hosting is probably the same thing. But I'll talk about all these. So we actually have a tracker for um, tracking people living with HIV and key population and this, this uh, COVID vaccine tracking system. So uh, for the background related to the key population uh, tracker that we have and people living in with HIV, it's a tracker uh, that we developed for FHI 360, and it's actually capturing data for uh, people living with HIV. So you have, first of all, for key population, you have counseling, testing, sensitization, condom distribution, and so on and so forth. And then, I mean, for ART treatment, we have a specific tracker where you could actually track the ones that are on ART and we get the, the information about treatment received. We can actually identify loss to follow up. And this uh, information, this tracker is used at the service delivery level to keep track of the people, the key population, the people living with HIV and also to do some basic analysis because they also need to know the number of uh, people that are lost to follow up so that they can identify them and track them. At the central level, they use the aggregate data for analysis and they also send it to donors. Uh, for the, the, the COVAX package, so we actually build on the COVAX package um, and then we, we actually tailor it to the country's needs. So at the service level, it's actually used to keep track of people that are going to be vaccinated. So you have a platform where people register and then after that, they get, uh, uh, they get a, a schedule for their first dose and then their second dose if it's AstraZeneca. At the moment, we mainly use AstraZeneca, so it's two doses, but the others are coming. So we have this possibility of, or this flexibility of actually having many doses. But they actually keep track of that, and we have an SMS that uh, actually sends uh, um, reminders to people that they are, going, they are going to have their second dose. 
And at the central level, you use that to see the progress in the immunization process because they want to know how many people are being enrolled, how many people have been vaccinated, how many have the second dose and so on and so forth. And this is actually done weekly. So you have a weekly meeting regarding that. So, well, when it comes to, to scaling, um, for the tracker for HIV, we have people living with HIV, we have around 200 users, 260,000 tracked entities, instance, and 800 organic, and eight, 80 organic, sorry. And then for the, the COVID one, we have like uh, 5,606 users. And then for the track entity instances, we have 305,947. And then for the organic, we have 1,727. So this is just a comparison that we have uh, when it comes to the, the approach, the scaling and hosting approach. So for the, the data entry for uh, the first tracker, which is the one for uh, people living with HIV, we had the service providers collecting the data on paper, and then they send the data to data clears that enter the data. Uh, for rollout strategy, we roll out at once. We didn't do a phased approach, but it's actually due to the fact that we actually didn't have um, a lot of uh, health facilities. So we could actually do that at once. Um, user support. Okay, so they have a team that, uh, because it's every time 360, they have a, a core team that actually helps people or goes to every facility to see if there are difficulties. They check out the data and there's a problem. They go, they, they ask the health facilities to see what is wrong with the fact that they are not entering the data and so on and so forth. So they actually, uh, they are trained to actually handle basic troubleshooting. But if they are intricate things, they actually uh, ask us to help them. So we, we do that a lot. But we also work with them because sometimes some of the users have our contacts. So sometimes they even write to us on WhatsApp. Um, for, for the HIV, they, start, they actually use laptops to enter the data and they, they actually uh, they have an office where they enter the data and then there's always electricity and internet connectivity. For the hosting, uh, it's cloud hosting, and uh, we actually have a separate instance. It's not part of the Togolese instance because it's actually Togo and Burkina here, and we don't have it in any national instance. It's a new instance. We have daily backups and we have regular updates, and we actually monitor the server. But for this one, the, the good thing is that we have access to the server, so we actually hosting it. So we have a lot of mechanism to make sure that um, the the system is regularly backed up. We monitor the, the server so that it actually has a, always, it's always up and so on and so forth. Now for the second one, uh, for COVID, uh, what happens is that the service providers are the ones actually entering the data directly. The, the rollout was phased because we started with the capital city and they started vaccination at the capital city. And then after we roll out in the, the, in the whole country. So it was a phased approach for that. Um, Actually, the HMI team was trained for, for basic troubleshooting. So the HMI team actually works on this a lot, but we actually intervene in some of the times, especially when they are intricate things. And we have a, a Telegram um, uh, in a platform where we actually uh, talk a lot. And if there's an issue, we try to solve it. But we work uh, a long time with the Ministry of, of Health and there's a Ministry of Digital Economy too. Uh, they are using the Android phones. Uh, because they are going to be in places where they don't usually have internet connectivity. So using an Android phone could help them have the data stored on the phone and then send on, onwards. So it's actually hosted in Togo. This platform itself is hosted in Togo um, by the Ministry of Digital Economy. And uh, it's a new instance. We actually do daily backups uh, because we also have access to the, the the server, they also have access, we have access. So we added things to it, like uh, we have a, the monitoring app, we have the, the, we set up a daily backup, et cetera, et cetera. But the server is here actually in total. Okay, so what we've learned, um, when it comes to user support and when it comes to data entry, uh, we realize that when you actually have data clerks, sometimes they are very good at uh, um, using the hardware and software. But the problem we have sometimes is that they, they actually don't understand what is written on paper. 
or sometimes they, there's a problem with the handwriting. So there are sometimes mistakes or data quality issues that, are, um, that come from that. Luckily, in most cases, they, they tend to be next to the, the, the service provider. So they sometimes go to the service provider and ask them that this um, sounds a bit, I don't understand how this is written. Can you explain it? So sometimes it's, it is solved. But sometimes there's also some uh, problems with the quality that is actually uh, detected afterwards. And then we try to solve it. But that is one of the issues. Uh, the rolling out strategy for 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 a small amount of uh, a small amount of facilities can be done at once if it's possible. That's what we we've done, but because we only had eighty uh, facilities, uh, the support we realized that we had to intervene a lot when it comes to maintenance because uh, there are slight issues here and there, performance issues. Uh, so we had to even work on the server sometimes. Uh, so we were more involved in, in maintaining the system, either the, the server or the DHS2 instance, uh, instance itself. Uh, we realized that when you are using laptops, we, you, know, you don't have, when you have low bandwidth or you have problem with internet connectivity or you don't have electricity, it might be tricky to, to use it. So there is, there's a need to do that. You need to actually make sure that you have those uh, um, requirements before setting up something on the laptop. Well, we also realize that hosting, you probably need to have a, a very high performance server. It's very, very important to have that because if you don't have it, uh, you'll be, be blocked. It's, it's, you need more performance uh, re related to the aggregated server. Uh, when it comes to the vaccination, we realized that some of them, uh, some of the users were not really familiar with the hardware, especially uh outside of the capital city so they were actually uh, community workers that actually know how to deal with the data but they don't know how to use the, the hardware nor the software so there's a need to actually uh, follow up a lot and then we they sometimes you have mistakes that are not used to the fact uh, that due to the fact that they don't know what they're entering but due to the fact that they don't know how to manipulate the system so they create duplicates and so on and so forth well, the rollout is recommended, in this case, since it's a lot of facilities, it was recommended to have a, a, a phase rollout, and that's what we did. Right. Uh, support, we actually had to work a lot on the maintenance area to solve some of the issues, because we also have a, we had a lot of duplicates because of the first problem uh, I cited. Uh, the first challenge I cited, and then we, we also had issues with the Android. So the Android version, um, the, uh, has, I mean, the, the web version has some features that you don't have in the Android. So we were a bit uh, stuck sometimes and we, need to, we needed to change some of the things uh, with it. When it comes to devices, uh, Android uh, phones are sometimes less convenient to users because of the size of the screen. And then you also have sometimes a problem with uh, hardware and software compatibility. Because uh, in, in this case, for example, they, they actually use a previous program lap, uh, phone. So the, the, the phone is a bit old. Yes, it's actually what we were able to install the app on it, but it's, the RAM is low. So the performance is a bit slow, but they actually use, uh, uh, instead of buying new phones, they actually use phones that are used for another project. Uh, as for hosting, since it's hosted in Togo, um, I, of course, you need to have a lot of um, high performance. But we, the good thing is that we had high qualified IT specialists in, in the Ministry of Digital Economy. So they were able to actually help us, help us to, to actually work on the server so that uh, we didn't, couldn't have, I mean, with that, we didn't have a lot of problems uh, implementing. Okay. So uh, quickly, this is what I can say about um, our experience in the approach of, of uh, scaling and, and hosting. If you have any question, we are free to um, um, feel free to ask. I'll be glad to answer. Over. Great, Jerry. Thank you for that presentation, and it was uh, it was really useful. I think to to see the different strategies uh, employed and kind of the differences between the tracker implementations, uh, which is definitely the case. 